Okay, welcome everybody. Um, on behalf of my co-organizers, Aliza Caffrey and David Zilber, I wanna welcome all of you to this new seminar series. Uh, we're excited to bring together uh, so many people, all of you, all of us with a common interest in fermented food and health. My name is Justin Sonnenberg. I'm a professor of microbiology and immunology at Stanford University. I have a longstanding interest in fermented foods. I've fermented food at home for many years and now have a, a rapidly expanding scientific interest with all of the new data that's coming out about how microbial transformation of food intersects with our gut microbes and our health. And clearly I'm not alone in this interest based on the hundreds of people we have signed up for this seminar series. So to tell you more about our goals, where we're headed and to introduce our first speaker, I wanna hand the microphone over to Eliza Caffrey, a superstar graduate student in my lab, currently studying fermented foods for her PhD thesis. Um, this seminar series is really her brainchild and it really only exists because of her organization and effort and vision for this. So uh, Eliza, take it away. Thank you so much, Justin, for that great introduction. Um, hi everyone, and thank you so much for joining us and welcome to our first fermentation and health speaker series brought to you by the Center for Human Microbiome Studies at Stanford University School of Medicine. Um, as Justin said, my name is Eliza Caffrey, and I'm a graduate student in his lab here at Stanford. And our lab is primarily interested in studying the relationship between diet, the gut microbiome, and health. And we became really interested in fermented foods after Hannah Wostick, who was a graduate student at the time, and Gabby Fregidakis, who was a postdoc at the time, co-authored a randomized clinical trial that was published in Cell in 2021 that found that fermented foods increased gut microbiome diversity and decreased markers of inflammation. And so we were left wondering, what is it about consumption of fermented foods that might mediate these effects? And at the same time, when you go to the supermarket, you also see this growing number of health claims around fermented foods, you know, saying that they're going to improve gut health. And so I became really interested in the question, just how much evidence is there to support these claims? And is it appropriate to recommend fermented foods to patients in a clinical setting, for example, um, because the paper that Dr. Wastik and Dr. Prajak has published on, uh, they had a healthy cohort of people that they were giving fermented foods to. And even beyond that, could fermented foods have benefits besides physiological health? And what does our shared history of consumption of these microbially transformed foods really say about our human roots? And so one conversation led to another, and I talked to David, I talked to Justin, and we decided to start the series with the goal of really creating a space for nuanced conversation around the current understanding and knowledge gaps of fermented food and research, as well as to kind of create a platform to define and promote future health foods and health projects. And so before introducing our first speaker, I just wanna go through a little housekeeping. So we're gonna record this um, and it will be posted in the next few days, both as a video and audio only. Each speaker will present some background for about 20 minutes. And then we're gonna to move to a moderate discussion and then there's time for Q&A. So if at any point you have questions, just type them into the chat and we're gonna to get to them. Um, and so with that, I wanna introduce our first speaker, David Zilber. David rose to fermentation fame as the director of fermentation at Noma, a restaurant which you're all familiar with. It's one of the best in the world located in Copenhagen. And then he left for Christian Hansen to work as a food scientist. And if you follow David, you know he's really passionate about science communication and has this really fantastic talent for bringing awareness of microbial life to his writing, photography, art, fashion, and food projects. You may know him from the New York Times bestselling book, The Noma Guide to Fermentation, but I also know that he has many other projects in the work. And so maybe in the next year, uh, we'll see more from David. Um, but he's both leading uh, the series and introducing the series by presenting a framework through which to really consider fermented foods and health. So with that, David, the floor is yours. Let me just unmute myself here. And thank you very much, Justin and Elisa, um, for the lovely introduction. I'll get into it <clears throat> and put my money where my mouth is. Um, I'll be talking a lot about mouths tonight. Cool. Let's do this. So um, I got my start in fermentation at a young age. Uh, I remember it very well. It was a hot early summer day in Toronto where I was born and raised. I was still in elementary school, uh, but also old enough to feed myself breakfast and set out on the day on my own. Um, as such, my parents had already left for work and my sister off to junior high. 
Uh, and I poured myself an extra large bowl of Honey Nut Cheerios with eyes much bigger than my stomach. Um, at the point in the morning where the cartoons were just wrapping up, I thought I thoughtlessly left my unfinished bowl of cereal milk with its small archipelago of, of O's on the kitchen counter and not thinking anything of it, headed out the door of the apartment to catch my bus. Spent an uneventful day at school doing all the things kids normally do on a hot summer day. But it was upon my return home at the same time as my mom that the day's most interesting events and slowly protracted events revealed themselves to me. At my mom's side, just as she was tidying up at the kitchen, uh, just before she was getting to fixing dinner, she spotted my bowl of cereal milk. And annoyingly, in her typical <laughs> Canadian Caribbean accent, punctuated with a sucking of her teeth, motioned to it and, tell, and told me to clean up after my damn self. So as I reached for the bowl with both hands from the very low angle um, afforded by my nine-year-old body, my thumb kind of jerked the spoon. And it was like pushing back against something. It was sitting in something like viscous. With the windows closed uh, in my family's modest two-bedroom apartment the whole day, uh, and the hot May sun beaming into the windows, my breakfast had been transformed. I picked up the spoon and watched the cereal milk trail off it in broken clumps. Why is it like this? Mummy, why is it like this? I exclaimed. My mother, never one to fuss about, stuck her pinky finger in, pulled it out, tasted it, and said, you made yogurt. But how did I make yogurt? Without a second thought, the bowl was promptly whisked over to the sink and dumped. My mom clearly had no time for such trivial things. She was probably exhausted from her long day at work. She just wanted to start prepping the chicken for dinner and not clean up after her, pre her precocious, hopelessly inquisitive, and hopelessly forgetful son. Thus, the unplanned homeschooled science experiment had been terminated. And while all the causal connection was established, no further underlying principles were elucidated to me at all. All I had to work with was leave milk out, get yogurt, sometimes. The pasteurized milk stored in one liter bags in my fridge surely hadn't brought these microbes to my milk. I had, and our warm, humid apartment served as the incubator, the cereal bowl as the urn. The microbes living in my mouth when transferred from mouth to spoon to bowl did exactly what they were born to do in their environment, be fruitful and multiply. Now there are two lessons to be gleaned from this story that I want to dig into in this talk. First, that there's a certain inevitability about the introduction of life from outside the bowl to its inside. The organism, an organism can only be said to be consuming sterile food, void of life under the most extreme forms of artifice which I'm sure Suzanne will get into uh, and as she discusses all the fascinating requirements of germ-free mice in her talk. But for most, every, for most everyone and everything on earth, the boundaries of a body are very fuzzy amorphous things. Hardly the hard silhouettes Parisian runways would have us think they are. We're in constant dialogue with the world around us, shedding our own selves from our bodies as we leave a cloudy aura of ourselves everywhere we go. Meanwhile, we're simultaneously stopping to pick up hitchhiking life everywhere we go by foot, bike, or bus. You don't just take public transport, you are public transport. The life that explodes upon us and in us in numbers at a moment's notice is given a chance or rather given an environment. Humans, it should be noted, along with a handful of other animals, have also gotten pretty darn good at making sure such requisite environments aren't just left up to chance. Which brings us to the second point. If it doesn't occur to you, it should also seem curious that an eight-year-old child could run an unplanned homeschooled science experiment and converge on the successful results of Tibetan yak herders who thousands of years prior mastered analogous practices, transforming milk of their woolly pack animals into nutritious, delicious, concentrated, lasting yogurts and butters, and still do to this day. Sure, a simple ferment like yogurt can be your breakfast, on purpose or otherwise. But by examining why something as innocuous as yogurt sits at the intersection of these two natural phenomena, let's call them spontaneity and persistence, an image of fermentation's role in human health begins to resolve. At first, they might seem like spurious footnotes, but the underlying impellers teach us much about not just humans, but what any organism requires to survive in a world hell-bent on tearing them apart from the moment we're born. Like Bob Dylan says, if you ain't busy being born, you're busy dying. That said, most of us would probably like that busy work to take as long as possible and no less be as gentle a ride to the grave as permissible. So with that, let's backtrack to my youth some 30 years prior when I was much less occupied with my inevitable death than I am now as a middle-aged man. 
Now, all of our mouths serve as a repository for the bacteria that constantly encroach upon the ramparts of our, corpore of our corporeal being. For all the talk of the importance of the gut microbiome, we should not forget that the gut isn't just one thing. It's a system of connected organs that runs from nose to tail, so to speak. Your GI tract actually starts with your mouth. The mouth is our main portal to the world around us, or rather, the world's main portal to us. And also, as we'll see, it's a fairly good synecdoche for a lot of different lessons on host microbe interactions that we're primed to understand the consequences of from a very young age, even if we don't learn the details. From a very young age, basically the moment we're born, as soon as we start to breathe and cry, even before we ever latch onto our mother's breasts and open our eyes to call the bright, big expanse of the earth our home, lactic acid bacteria called our mouths their home. After all, how could such mesophilic anaerobes ever resist the opportunity to colonize a mouth? It feels almost like they were made for it. It has everything they need, warmth, wetness, nooks and crannies void of oxygen, and if all's going well for their hosts, a constant supply of food. Better than three hots in a cot, if you ask me. It's also recently been discovered that the human immune system is actually suppressed in the first few months of life, specifically to allow beneficial microbes to colonize our bodies and acquaint themselves with them. But there is a yin and yang to their occupation. They aren't exactly invited, but we've evolved both biologically and culturally at once to tolerate, but also require their presence. And this is indeed a curious proposition. Think about it, a little thought experiment. Imagine installing a security system on your house to keep you and your family safe. One day you come home to a fiendishly clever burglar chilling on your sofa. He's managed to disable the fire alarm with his computer wizardry skills, and now he's in, of all the precious things that he could have stolen from your well-curated home, he's raided the fridge, and he's making sandwiches for himself, leaving a mess in the kitchen in the process, and in the living room. And when he goes to the toilet, he doesn't even flush. No, this uncouth slob leaves duty duty to you. Yet for all this inconvenience, you don't kick him out. You continually just navigate around him, even if he takes up more and more space. You tolerate his presence. Why? Well, on the news last night, the anchor put out a community-wide warning in response to a string of vicious and violent home invasions. You heard rumors of neighbors a few blocks over being assaulted by a perp just last week, funny game style. Yet somehow, you feel at ease because of the non-violent criminal sat in your living room. He's been to prison once before, you know that much. He knows how to fight, but he's not threatening you. But you know that while he's up late at night with the glow of infomercials bleeding through the window onto the street, the real threats feel threatened themselves. Your home is no longer an easy target. The ax murderers leering in from the bushes ask themselves, why take the fight? This oddly beneficial, if tenuous partnership takes place in your mouth, but also deep inside and all over your body. The human oral microbiome consists of both symbionts, microbes that we manage to live with and can even be said to need, and pathobionts, more opportunistic organisms that can lead to a state of disease if given the chance to proliferate unchecked. But the definition of a symbiont versus a pathobiont is heavily perspective dependent, and just keep that in mind. When the relative population dynamics of an oral microbiome in symbiosis encounter turbulence, it can be said that the resultant state is one of dysbiosis, a state of community disturbance. Dysbiosis could arise from a slew of any factors that predispose a shift in the composition and abundance of microbial communities. Insofar as the proportional makeup of dysbiotic community strays from what it looks like in a snapshot of health, it can be said to lie at the root of lots of systemic microbiome-related infections. The switch is usually directed by important pathogens that scientists like to call keystone pathogens, which in a domino effect have the ability to modulate the makeup of microbial communities once they take hold. One persistent oral infection is periodontitis. There's lots that you could talk about, but we're just gonna stick to one for now. I'll be frank, when I was working at NOMA, it's not like we had healthcare benefits or even like I had tons of cash. It took me finally quitting after six plus years to go to the dentist for a regular checkup. I know, scold me. Save for the emergency root canal I got during Noma, Mexico, but that's a different story. My dentist asked if my gum sometimes bled when I brushed or flossed. And I said, yeah, but I thought it was kind of normal. She checked my gum line and let me know that some of my gum pockets were deep. 
and I needed to get special picks to clean them out really regularly if I wanted to avoid more serious trouble down the line. This was the onset of periodontitis, she let me know. And as I sat there, uh, open, with nothing but time to think about this, my mind raced to the idea of bacteria living in me, causing me harm. Now, periodontitis is the constant inflammation of the gum line surrounding your teeth. And given enough time, it can lead to the gum line's recession and a weakening, a weakening of the tooth's root and eventually tooth loss. Keystone pathogens like Porphyromonas gingivalis, I can't believe I said that right, can cohabitate alongside many species present within a healthy microbiome, often beneath levels of detection, even when microbial analysis are performed using quite standard techniques. They're there, but quiet. But given the right confluence of circumstances, such bacteria's numbers can actually grow. Not a huge explosion, but just enough to alter their ratio in the environment relative to the bacterial common salts. But what sort of circumstance? Well, poor oral hygiene counts, dietary habits, smoking, genes, a dysfunction of the salivary glands, and sometimes, as one scientist even put it, just plain bad luck. Now, I won't feign to intimate, I won't feign an intimate understanding of just how complex these interactions are. The papers I'm pulling from aren't able to either. Community interactions between individual microbes can be mind-bogglingly complex. Approximately 500 to 700 species are estimated to reside in the oral cavity, of which half can be cultivated anaerobically in the lab through current micro microbiological techniques. But get this, the other half still remain unculturable in vitro, thus eluding our study of them in the lab. Scientists still don't have a firm enough grasp on their environmental needs or behaviors to place them into a petri dish primed with agar and watch them grow, even if those very same microbes are teeming in their mouths. Now, this might seem surprising. We sometimes like to think that all that science touches has long been cataloged and all that's left to go, all that's left to do is go through our findings with ever finer tooth combs. But the reality of it is that we're still shrouded in ignorance about the living world quite literally in front of or under our nose. In the broadest strokes, however, it's by no means controversial to state that such diverse communities are built off delicate webs of interdependence. In the same way that a forest growing on diverging ground after a forest fire or flood evolves over time and never looks the same at any two points between the first sprouts of pyrophytes to take root and the rich panoply of life to be found at every level of the forest between the floor and its canopy decades later. Sure, it's important to see the forest for the trees, but it's also important to see the environments nestled within the forest fractally and within each individual tree. This past summer, I traveled to the Cayman Islands to make palm wine. I remember vividly being 20 meters up in the canopy, peeling back a coconut frond to try to tap a tree and discovering an arboreal ant colony buzzing about in the treetops, an ant colony that did not exist on the ground. Any bodily system functions the same way. For the sake of our own sanity or even understanding each other, we have no choice but to try to simplify these discussions about what lives within us and where, but to organisms 12 orders of magnitude smaller than we are, each one of us is a whole planet. You are, after all, only eight orders of magnitude less voluminous than the Earth itself. The environment of you is as variegated as the Alps are from the ocean. And even within your mouth alone, you find pockets of differences dissimilar to each other as the Sahara is from the Everglades. Now, when you're born, species of Streptococcus are usually the first pioneering microbes to plant their flag in your mouth. Streptococcus salivarius, found mostly on the tongue and dorsum. Streptococcus mitis on the mucosal lining of your cheeks. Streptococcus sanguinis on the gums. The growth and metabolism of these pioneer species, as they're called, change the local environmental conditions such that local redox potential can drop, pH drops, the availability of nutrients and factors which prime the environment for more fastidious organisms to grab a foothold thereafter then. Over time, other microbial communities take over. Prevotella, Fusobacterium, Neisseria, Lactococcus, and more. As the total variety of genera absolutely skyrockets. By the time your adult teeth come in, this continual succession of microbes is eventually replaced with a stable homeostasis of microbial communities referred to as a climax community, whereby different bacteria interact to establish an ecosystem where each community member contributes in some form to support the other. 
to the overall dynamic continuity of the environment that is your mouth. Now let's just examine what homeostasis really means. Like the improvised percussionist in Stomp. Sorry, I'm a 90s baby, so I remember this quite vividly. The metabolisms and actions of individual bacteria don't ever seem to sound like music, just one guy railing on a garbage can. But with enough of them interacting on stage together, wondrous harmonies begin to emerge out of the fuge. This music is homeostasis. Now let's take a look at a fascinating subset of that homeostasis within your mouth, because as mentioned, as an environment, it's not a monolith. With the development of adult teeth, a new lasting habitat is created, one called the gingival crevice, that's up here, which is cleaned and nourished by a secretion your body produces called gingival crevicular fluid, or GCF. Along with saliva, GCF is critical for the maintenance and integrity of your gum line and contains antimicrobial peptides and immunoglobins, but interestingly, also contains a range of other active proteins and nutrients that support resident microflora and influence the ecology of the oral cavity. The secretion, the secretion of, G, of GCF physically flushes out the crevice, providing a stream of fluid pressure that defends against, against microbial insult, but is also counterintuitively delivering novel nutrients to them in the form of protein and glycoproteins, ones that bacteria use for their metabolism in the same area. This includes iron rich molecules. This includes iron-rich molecules like hemoglobin and transferrin. But unlike dental cavities, many bacteria associated with periodontitis that might exist in the gum line can't metabolize car carbohydrates for energy. They're proteolytic. They consume proteins. It should be noted that as inflammation from periodontitis increases, your body starts producing more and more GCF in an attempt to flush out the irritant culprits, but simultaneously feeds them at the same time, a double-edged sword. Now, if you'll forgive me for my aside, this is a highly interesting and recurrent theme that pops up again, again in host microbe interactions. As I mentioned in regard to the yogurt bowl, there is a certain inevitability to life making its way into any space capable of hosting it. Like an intrepid dandelion pushing out of the side of a cracked concrete wall, microbial life acts in exactly the same way, if not more so. It would be a teleological misnomer to talk about your body as being aware of this fact and having taken actions over evolutionary time against it. But it's not wrong to frame this constant encroaching threat as so strong a selective pressure that our genomes had no choice but to malleably evolve both in spite of and because of it. The gingival fluid contradictorily must flush microbes out of your mouth one of your body's most sensitive boundaries and use its chemical defenses to defer their pro proliferation, but also provide certain microbes with the nutrients needed for their survival. Curiously, we can't say whether proteinous extricates found in this fluid are consumed opportunistically by the anaerobic bacteria that find our way into the gum line, or if we've evolved to nurture their presence. But perhaps the point is moot. Nature doesn't ever operate in absolutes. In reality, the evolutionary history of such symbiosis is most definitely a combination of these two angles. But within that reality lies a fascinating truth. No matter how you look at it, our genome has evolved to not just accommodate, but actively support our microbiota. Their constant presence over generational time force changes in our genome. And changes in our genome can be said to have dictated what species of bacteria were given a welcome invitation to call us home. The genetic co-evolutionary feedback leads to a tenuous balance. GCF contains within it the promotional, but also progressive, suppressive biological factors needed to maintain a healthy mouth. But no, bacterial keystone pathogens that lead to oral disease are normal members of a hugely diverse oral microbiome. It's only when pathobiome populations relative to other microbes in your mouth experience a tectonic shift that we recognize a swing from symbiosis to dysbiosis. It's almost as if the members of a choir were at once singing in harmony and decided to suddenly switch up their roles, leading some tenors to start singing baritone, throwing off the luster of the hymn, even though no singer left the stage. That analogy, though useful, is imperfect. A choir is made up of four voice types, four voice types with maybe 20 to 30 singers, but your oral microbiome numbers in hundreds of species totaling tens of billions of individuals. That diversity, is strength. 
because even if disrupted between many species, there's enough metabolic redundancy that can see the same macroscopic effect of homeostasis arise from a slew of different starting points. The harmony of symbiosis is at once delicate but robust. It is a dynamic equilibrium, a complex interaction that even if constantly changes, converges upon the same result, nominally one of a healthy mouth. But that equilibrium is a tenuous one. The normal metabolisms of the very same microbes we've evolved to host will eventually also lead to the deterioration of the our environment, if not managed consistently. Poor oral hygiene being one of the biggest underlying factors of oral disease. Your mom told you that, so did your dentist. You see, the microbes in your mouth aren't just camping out in stasis. They're alive and constantly eating food and expelling waste. As detritus, as detritus from your meal gets stuck in your teeth, your microbes feast, and they produce lactic acid, among other products, as a function of their metabolism. If left alone, this acid accumulates and lowers the pH of your mouth to the point of being able to degrade your dental enamel. This creates cavities, which serve as new, often anaerobic niches for other keystone pathogens responsible for the aforementioned advanced oral diseases like periodontitis. It's the cascade. Dental caries are no laughing matter. Tooth decay can lead to sepsis and has been correlated to other ailments of the body ranging from Alzheimer's to cardiovascular disease to rheumatoid arthritis. But carbohydrate loving lactic acid bacteria that make up the bulk of our oral microflora and we're inviting into the house. Well, we've even biologically evolved to make their stay as hospitable as possible. But then why is that? The coevolutionary state of our microbiome in our mouth is the end result of millions of years of microbe mammalian interactions. Why have we not just evolved to produce bacteriosins in our blood that keep them at bay and keep our mouths sterile, as sterile as our bloodstream? Well, two reasons. Sterility is about as real and attainable as Plato's forms. Every gram of food we ingest brings about a million microbes into our bodies via our mouth. Thus, we return to the notion of inevitability in these ecological frameworks. At the end of the day, if, something, if something's going to live within you, better the devil you know. Their presence suppresses levels of more harmful pathogens through something known as colony resistance. Just by virtue of their being there, microbes like Streptococcus and Lactococcus and other com communalistic, commensalistic species take up physical space within your mouth, stealing real estate and resources from more harmful species. This is to everyone's benefit. Because should this dynamic equilibrium between species collapse, well, so too would their homes. By inviting the microbes whose presence we can tolerate and whose negative effects we can mediate, we stave off worser fate. We domesticated dogs and pay the tax on their company out of our food budget. And they, in turn, help keep wild wolves at bay. Wolves that would eat both us and our food if they could. The freeloading burglar keeps the ax murderer out of the house. The other reason, earlier on, I mentioned that we've evolved alongside our microbes, both evolutionarily and culturally. Well, the fact is that from a young age, we're taught the importance of dental health can't be disregarded. Cultural evolution is as powerful a force as genetic factors in determining the fitness of organisms and their, micro and their microbial entourage collectively. What some of us like to call hollow violence or whole organisms. At the end of the day, post-dinner, you might have had as many as a billion microbes living on each tooth. The act of brushing knocks that number down to a thousand. Brushing one's teeth is by no means a modern or Western phenomenon either. Toothsticks made of Saladoria prescia, aka the toothbrush tree, have been used for over a thousand years in Africa and Arabia. In India, twigs of tea trees, neem, and licorice are all used for the same purpose primarily because they contain antimicrobial agents within their wood. The practice in the region dates back to at least ancient Babylonia five and a half thousand years ago. This constant maintenance can never completely eliminate the microbes in the mouth. They do bounce back the time, multiplying every 20 minutes or so. This is the kind of, but this is kind of the whole reason why I'm spending so much time talking about dentistry. Oral health, when viewed from the perspective Remind me later, I don't want to update Java right now. Excuse me, I'm busy. Oral health, when viewed from the perspective of microbial ecology, is tantamount to forest ranging. 
your Ranger Smith in Jellystone Natural Park. And for the good of the forest, the rich, dynamic, and biologically diverse place that it is, well, you regularly go out, you, you regularly have to go out with a gun and do your job. The mouth is a microcosm. Health to a mouth becomes a type of exercise that melds culture and biology. As much as we might love the idea of quick, of quick fix panaceas, if your doctor assesses your risk of non-communicable diseases and tells you to get more exercise to save up what she perceives to be as an inevitable heart attack, going to the gym once will not save you. She's instructing you to create lasting behavioral change that consistently and persistently modifies the environment, the cells your body calls home experience. The same goes for bacteria that call your body home. Now, let's zoom way out and look at the other half of this equation. Let's return to the idea of conversions, of persistence, and how it's possible that I, as an eight-year-old kid, was able to recreate a similar product to the traditional daring societies that have masterfully produced foods like yogurt continually without interruption for thousands of years. Well, as spontaneously as microbes appear in your mouth, they also appear in your food. But that's not a one-way street. Boundaries are fuzzy things. And anything that can come in through a door can also use that door as an exit. In one of the papers I found in my research for this talk, there was a graph of a phylogenetic tree identifying about 118 cultivable species of bacteria found in a sample human oral microbiome. In combing through the taxa, and just my own knowledge here working at Christian Hansen, I discovered that no less than 38 of those bacterial species are ones regularly employed in fermentation of food. From Lactococcus lactus in your Activia fruit cups to the Streptococci performing malolactic fermentation or Actinomyces species that are part of the foundational flora of Chinese baiju, your body is a veritable vault of the microbes employed in, fru in food fermentation. The same lactic acid bacteria that my mother would have me brush out of my mouth each night, not that she ever had to employ microbiology to get me to wash up for bed, are also the ones humans the world over have employed wittingly or unwittingly in the production of their foods. Like the mythic stir sticks passed down from grandmothers to their daughters, the tools we use for food can become totems for the microbial lineages, lineages that live around us, on us, and in our food. My bright yellow plastic Ikea spoon that that morning may have had less meaning, but it no less accomplished the same task. Like an interplanetary spaceship, they transferred microbes from the environment of my mouth to a new world in a bowl full of milk sweetened with bits of honey nut o's. This gets at a tenet of biology postulated by Bass Becken, that everything is everywhere, but the environment selects. All manners of microbes from my mouth ended up in that bowl but it was the ones primed to thrive in milk and dine on lactose that were the ones to blossom. Without the, in, without the accidental introduction of lactic acid bacteria into that bowl of milk, any number of wild microbes might have truly spoiled it into a not pleasantly sour and mildly sweetly thickened version of itself, but something pink and green and putrid and slimy. The benefit of the transformation is yogurt's low pH, of course, created by the microbes responsible for the fermentation. Yogurt is a form of preserved milk. And looking back through history, such a simple benison as longer shelf life, though there are plenty of strictly hedonistic reasons to enjoy fermented foods, served as enough of a push wherever humans lived that we encoded these rituals, the, the rituals responsible for the creation into our cultures and preserved them until today. Those rituals have become our comfort foods our special occasion foods and our traditions, no matter if you're a second generation South, South Korean American enjoying kimchi for breakfast or a Papua New Guinean native sipping yawa at dusk. One such traditional, one such traditional society that, predis, that persists to this day is in Tibet. There, they milk yaks, not Canadian bred Holsteins. The yak is central to all aspects of their life, essential to all households, the domestic yak provides a mean of transforming the cold, rocky, high altitude land of the Tibetan Plateau, a region viewed as unproductive by the CCP, into farmable land. The animals graze on vegetation unsuitable for human consumption, transforming it into their very bodies. Powerful bodies that can be equipped with plows for plowing the land, helping with the harvest and carrying heavy loads. Their dung, when dried and mixed with straw, provides fuel for their fires. 
The yak offers up its soft white wool for warmth in the form of blankets and garb, but also its long black hairs for utility, woven into rope and cloth for their nomad tents. At the end of its life, yak hide provides leather for making shoes and saddlebags when traveling by horseback. Meanwhile, its meat provides sustenance, first being dried in the sun in the summer and stored as part of a staple diet in the winter. So to value a yak solely for its flesh is to waste the valuable and productive life that the people who live on the roof of the world consider essential. A live yak of reproductive age can be milked throughout the summer, but also through the winter, lending their milk to herders who must share it with their calves that can wean up for two years. In contrast, the factory farm Angus can be sent to slaughter at the same age or less. Yaks give their milk to be drunk fresh, of course, but also for making jo, a thick, sour yak milk yogurt cultured with backslop that stretches back further than any Tibetan can remember. Now, this is also a fascinating thing to consider, that the culture that exists in these Tibetans' yogurt jo is a cultural practice that must be transmitted from mother to daughter or father to son, stretching back through millennia. I wonder who taught my mom to brush her teeth like she taught me, and who taught my grandmother to brush her teeth like she taught my mom. And you start to see how these kind of analogous versions of continuation that straddle both biology and culture manage to perpetuate the systems that allow microbes to thrive in us and on us for generational time. And this is why persistence is so fascinating to me. Now in that yogurt, I found a fascinating paper that was a complete metagenomical analysis of what actually grows within it. Genera like Lactococcus, Lactobacillus, Pseudomonas, and Streptococcus all show up in abundance. And wouldn't you guess, they're all regular members of the human microbiome too, not just in the mouth either. Now this is a little aside, it's not written into my script here, but there was a fascinating, fascinating problem I dealt with at Noma. The picture's not on the wall, but there was one summer where we were making moldy egg yolks. We would, we would cure the eggs in salt and they would be like par cooked and gooey. And then we would grow koji on them. And it was a fantastic dish. It was paired with truffles. It was in a tart, a hit on the summer menu. Until one day about kind of halfway through after doing it for a month, Ben Ng, the head chef comes to me and says, hey, David, some of the eggs are bad. And I'm like, bad, how can they be bad? We're, we're super on top of this. We have like such a good schedule going. It works every time. We never lose eggs in the incubator. I said, taste it. And I tasted it. And I'm there with the chef de partie who's responsible for making it. And he's like, do you, do you taste it? And I'm like, yeah, it's super cheesy. The eggs were not supposed to be cheesy. They're supposed to be rich and umami filled and, and, and a bit sweet. And he's like, we can't serve these. They're not off, but they're not right. And I'm like, it's not a bad flavor. It's like, yeah, but it's not the flavor we're supposed to be serving. So then I had to hit the books and solve the problem. I learned after discussing with a few other cooks that the flavor I was tasting was the flavor of Ipois cheese, the semi-washed rind, bright kind of reddish orange cheese from France. That is kind of a cheese you think of when someone says they cut the cheese. Well, it was that flavor. And I'd realized that these chefs in the kitchen that would take the eggs out of the tray and have to then you know trim them up and make sure that they were nicely lined up for service and weren't in the same conditions as the laboratory at Noma, stressed out, having to constantly run around and wiping their brow to get the sweat out of their face in the hot summer. Well, they were transferring Brevibacterium brevis from their sweaty faces to the eggs. Now the eggs were consumed every day, of course, and the molds were washed. But a dishwasher is not an autoclave. And over time, there was enough Brevibacterium brevis still left in the mold that it eventually started to contaminate all these trays that were then mixed together when they would try and just wash them out or soak them in a little bit of water. And we had a microbial bloom. Now, Brevibacterium brevis is not an evil microbe. It is a normal part of your human microbiome. It is, for better or worse, the smell of a sweaty armpit or a sweaty foot. But it also does amazing things like dissolve proteins. And that's why it's used in cheese because it makes umami. And that's exactly what it was doing in our eggs. Now, 
I took the actual eggs under a microscope and actually kind of looked for what bacteria were there. And even though I'm no microbiologist and I don't have a gene sequencer, I lined up all of these cheese bacteria with what I was looking at under the scope and kind of finally settled based on the flavor profile and the shape of the actual bacteria themselves to discover that, well, hey, this normal member of the human microbiome was now living in the food that we were, being, that we were serving at Noma. At that point, we kind of went back to scratch. I ordered new silicone molds. I completely sterilized the incubators and I fried everything that they'd ever touched in a 400 degree oven for about 40 minutes. It worked, but I was given a very, very important lesson about the nature of boundaries when it comes to the foods we eat and the people that make them. Getting back to Tibet, forgive my aside. Now on Tibet's border with China, Zhou is made from cow's milk with what Tibetans describe as relatively tasteless. Now, if not consumed immediately with brown sugar on rice or top boiled white sweet potato, Zhou is most often churned in the tan stomach of a lamb to turn it into yak butter, which if yak wrapped in yak leather or rhododendron leaves can last for up to a year. Used not just for all the standard applications that you can imagine, a cheesy butter to fill, yak butter also fuels lamps, serves as an art supply, skin moisturizer, leather tanner, but it's most loved to Tibetans as yak butter tea which is sipped on four or five dozen times a day in the most mountainous regions of the country. It's made of hot tea, butter, and a pinch of salt. It's also Tibet's national drink. Also, interesting, in, also interestingly enough, and very relevant to this talk, it was the inspiration for Bulletproof Coffee. The guy who started it, this guy that wrote all these books on biohacking, questionable, I know, he was traveling through Tibet and had this, and he said that he felt much better after eating it. Probably believe that. Then he takes it back to the States and then spins it into this giant health claim and just says that if you put fat in your tea or your coffee in the morning, you'll feel great throughout the day. But we'll come back to that. To Tibetans, their folk knowledge of what leads them to long lives and health is intrinsically tied to the practices of preservation that have allowed them to thrive in some of the most rarefied air on earth. If any one of us in this talk were to be planted on the top of the Himalayas and said, have fun, go it alone, we would probably be dead within a week. But it's interesting that there are whole communities, tribes of people that have lived up there for millennia and have figured out how to use the wild animals within their surroundings, but also the microbes within their surroundings to make lasting foods that allow them to thrive. This is one of the ways where fermentation becomes intrinsically linked to health. Because if it's so vital in the preservation of food, and what is the preservation of food, if not the preservation of food against spoilage, against contamination, and it's the very thing keeping them alive, well then, by definition, it becomes healthy, or the only way to health and long life. In my Encyclopedia of Fresh Fermented Milk Products, Joe is credited with being, as being beneficial to both the gastrointestinal tract and to long life. And you know what? For all those reasons, I believe it. As far as health claims go, that's pretty restrained. And that's very far from the spurious and sometimes outlandish claims made by Westerners about cure-all superfoods that disproportionately, and I quote from one study I found, seem to benefit the individuals that sell them the most. Take the extreme example of kombucha. It's been purported to treat AIDS, slow aging, cure anorexia nervosa, arthritis, arthrosclerosis, cancer, constipation, diabetes, help digestion, rid your body of toxins, boost your energy, boost your immune system, help you lose weight, ward off high blood pressure, heart disease, to say the least. The problem is that all these claims seem to come in one form or another from anecdotes of people who drink kombucha and have lived a life. They're not necessarily founded on research conducted in double-blind, large cohort studies. And this is why it's sometimes hard to separate the wheat from the chaff when it comes to fermentation. The people who want to believe the benefits only decry its praises when a positive correlation is made, but they also tend to speak the loudest. It's a statistical fact that there are individuals who succumbed to cancer last year who also drank kombucha but you can't credit kombucha for not doing something. Likewise, 
if you told your doctor you were going to forego targeted chemotherapy and instead start drinking tea, they just might order a psychological assessment before releasing you from the hospital. But there are links to be made. We just have to be very sober about how we think about them. First, like brushing one's teeth, to regularly rid the environment of you from the accumulation of bacteria and their biofilms in the form of plaque, the health benefits of fermented food should equally be viewed as being meaningful when they turn into a regimen, like exercise. I can't remember the books I've read any more than the meals I've eaten, but either way, they have made me. A quote from an author that I love, but funny that, if you reverse it, is equally attributable to the cook. As we've seen, you're a dynamic environment unto yourself. What you're made of is never fixed, but constantly shifting. And if you eat regularly foods full of life that also have the ability to foster that life, life that lives regularly in the foods you consume, but also inside of you, then you can be said to be a ranger taking care of a healthy forest. In nature, every opportunity costs something not accomplished elsewhere in some other environment. Biology is a series of mutually exclusive trade-offs and compromises. So when you choose to eat fermented foods on a regular basis, you're also omitting a whole slew of other foods that, if you live in a Western country like me, are probably inert, preserved through chemical means, highly processed and narrow in their dietary contributions. If you put kimchi on your plate at dinner, you leave off mashed potatoes. If you have water kefir as your drink with it, you aren't drinking Coke. And that's an important link that is, it, we also can't forget when it comes to thinking about the health benefits of fermented foods. They are, in many means, inherently healthy. If you leave a bottle of Coca-Cola on the counter for a week, nothing will grow in it. You can look at it under a microscope, it will be the same, just flat. Because there are enough preservatives, a low enough pH that life can't thrive. If you take a head of cabbage and turn it into an environment capable of fostering the things that are already on you inside of it, well, then you're turning the crock into a secondary gut, really, a stomach capable of outsourcing the act of digestion in advance of your consumption, while also preserving it for later in your annual schedule. That link, that the things that would normally be going on inside you can happen in your food, and if you eat enough of them, kind of wash out all of the negative aspects of living in the modern world, just by, in a way, colony resistance, you come to a very kind of healthy and sober conclusion about the nature of healthy fermented foods. And that's the point. There was a funny thing in the article on kombucha I pulled up where I went through all of the lists. Lots of doctors, even though they understand that the claims are pretty wild, they also say, well, what's the cost benefit analysis? Say that someone believes that drinking kombucha is super, super good for them, even if we can't prove it. Is there really a downside to its constant consumption? And the answer is no. And that's not the worst thing in the world to have to deal with. Now, there's no doubt that Tibetan yak herders experience long life when they drink their fermented milk dozens of times a day, ingesting the microbes that live in those products, but also the substrates that they thrive in as well. The more of the partridge fermentation takes up in your diet, the more attuned your body becomes as an environment to microbes both within and without. And I'd just like to finish off this talk with a thought about crops where all of this food comes from at the end of the day, the earth. Think about monocultures. Think about how intensively a farmer has to plow their field. What sort of chemical inputs need to be put into the earth to make a 10 hectare farm growing one type of wheat into a profitable endeavor? What would that 10 hectare farm look like with no intervention? Well, in a couple of years, it would turn into a prairie, a prairie filled with rabbits and weeds and dandelion and hemlock and all sorts of things that you normally find in the wild. Now contrast that to biodynamic farming, where a farmer decides that there should be a diversity of crops within a field. 
Now think about what those two fields look like from the point of view of the pest. Because flipping the perspective, as I'm talking about symbionts and pathobionts, or pests and crops, teaches us a lot about what we're actually trying to think about. To the point of view of, let's say, a nematode worm that's extremely good at eating the roots of wheat plants and, and causing a blight. If in your local vicinity, in an area that's one square meter across, which is what you can reasonably travel in your lifetime because you're so small. If you only eat one type of food and the root system of one plant connects to another and another and another and another and another, and all that's on the menu is a worm, is your favorite dish prepared every night, well, you're gonna explode. It's too much of a good thing. But if you break up that field and you plant wheat in some patches, peas in another, clover in another, and you kind of all let it intermingle, and you let different rows grow different things, and you have trees on there, trees that then grow flowers that support pollinators and ants maybe that like to eat nematode worms. Well, all of a sudden, as a nematode worm looking to eat that wheat, you have a far less good chance of being able to thrive in this environment. Why? Because it's diverse. The same goes for your body. The environment of a farm is not so different from the environment of you. If you ingest foods that a diverse set of microbes like to eat, you give yourself resistance and robustness against the collapse of a fragile system. From the mouth to the butt, it's all connected. And that's my talk about fermentation and health. Um, thank you, David, so much. Uh, you gave a really great crash course on microbial ecology and it was fantastic. Um, there are a few questions that I think we can get at here. Um, the first is about fermented foods, whether when you buy them, we buy them pasteurized or cooked and therefore without these live organisms. Um, are we still benefiting from microorganisms? Are we failing for selective marketing claims? Which I think you focus a lot on the live microbes and this relationship that we have between microbes in the food and to our bodies. But um, yeah, I don't know if you wanna take the question or- Yeah, I would love to. Um, sorry, I was just trying to figure out how to get my screen full window full screen and I, I don't know how, <laughs> it's fine. View, meeting, gallery view, gallery view? No, that's not working, I'm sorry. I'll stop, it doesn't matter, I can still see you. Um, there, there is still a benefit to eating pasteurized fermented foods. Um, first of all, likewise, again, you are eating something that is high in fiber, you are eating something that the microbes within you will still feast upon once it enters your system. If you if you buy a bottle of kimchi and you have, you know, brown rice and kimchi in a bowl, great. You're eating fiber and you're eating what doctors and scientists like to call postbiotics. Lots of, again, I don't think to understand all of the ins and outs of microbial interactions, especially not if they happen inside of you. But it's no joke to say that microbes communicate with each other and with your body and influence lots of things about your, 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 your body's own, about how your body runs. But to communicate as a microbe, you can't talk. You can't be like, hey, body, make more of this for me or like make more of this hormone. You have to induce communication via, via chemicals released from your metabolism. Um, when you grow microbes through a food, all of those chemicals are still there. All of those metabolites, all those postbiotics, things that have that persist after biota, the life has died, um, are still there and still have some benefit. Um, I don't want to say how much benefit. I don't even know if you could quantify it, but there is a benefit to consuming something that microbes have lived through, uh, even if it's not pasteurized. Um, 
I say it all the time. Sometimes, you know, in cooking, if you're looking to achieve a great flavor, sometimes you have to kill microbes because you, you have to pasteurize them to for whatever number of reasons. Um, but it doesn't mean that the food is somehow like not worth eating. Um, it just means that it's not live, but it still contains lots of benefit. Could I add to that as well? Um, By all means. But, so the yeah during the fermentation process, microbes not only are um, they're communicating to each other right in order to to grow, but then they're producing these metabolites, which are the chemical compounds you talk about that will eventually signal within the body as well. And those might signal to the gut microbiome. They'll signal to your upper GI tract, your immune system, et cetera. That landscape, we don't understand at all. And it's a very, very interesting world to start exploring is what is happening. But it is really interesting to think about that we do need to really characterize these metabolites over the course of the fermentation process itself. And to be careful that if someone identifies a certain chemical compound in fermented foods and then starts adding it to a food, it doesn't necessarily mean that it might have the same benefits as when you're actually consuming a food that comes along with not only other metabolites, but also with the fiber or these other benefits. And so until we start understanding all the different components of these foods and um, the, the way that they interact with not only the microbes in fermented foods with each other, but also with the body, it's really hard to then make these very generalized health claims. And I also want to add flavor is also a metabolite. And that's also very important because at the end mm -hmm. of the day, they also taste good. And that's something you worked on for your entire career. Yes. More questions? Let's see. Um, we can maybe have time for one more. Um, just looking at how do you ensure that fermented foods at home don't get contaminated? Um, best practices, I would say, um, make sure that your jars are clean. They don't have to be sterile. You don't have to like boil them, but make sure that they're washed out. Um, make sure that everything is submerged. Make sure that the environment is the environment that the microbes need. I think one of the, I was just like trolling through trolling, not trolling, um, through like, the uh, Reddit fermentation thread. And it's like one of the biggest, like, hey, what's wrong with this is, is someone making sauerkraut where like the leaves are sticking up underneath the water line of the bride. And that's like a perfect example of like, how do you avoid contamination? Well, you make sure that the environment is the one that the ferment as a hollow biont, if you want to consider it that way, is the one that its microbes need to, to thrive. And if a successful sauerkraut doesn't want oxygen, make sure that the oxygen isn't there. Um, so it's, it's really paying attention to those crucial details, which is kind of ultimately like making a little asset plan in your head. Like, hey, where can this go wrong? Is the, is the lid not secure? Could a fruit fly get inside here? Um, was there a little piece of food that was like stuck inside the jar that I didn't see when I cleaned it? Um, did I make sure that, you know, I, I actually use my scale correctly? I have the right amount of salt. All of these things are, are very simple practices, but if you have to pay attention to them and, and know that these are points where things can go awry, then make sure that they don't, uh, to make sure that they don't. Awesome. I think we will be able to get to the other questions, maybe in the email that we'll send out. And so we'll respond to those. Um, and so we don't go over time. But with that, I just want to Thank David and Justin so much for this. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Suzanne Devkota, who is an associate professor and director of the Senior Sinai Microbiome Research Institute. And she will be discussing the current applications and limitations of fermented food in a clinical setting. She's presenting February 28th. And so keep an eye out for updates. And I'll send out an email to the recording and us answering any other questions that were left in the chat um, later on this week. And thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you all.